Hello and welcome to podcast episode with John Smallwood. Today we're going to talk about the three core financial pressures that are eroding your wealth. John, let's start with the three categories of these financial pressures and then let's unpack each of them. So what are the three? So basically, we're focused on three core areas, the government, financial institutions, and corporations are constantly trying to get our money. We're basically transferring wealth from ourselves to these three entities. Everybody in the world is subject to this. But if you don't know where it's happening, Mm -hmm. you might be letting more slip out of your plan than you should be. Now, we did a podcast on the new tax law, and Mm -hmm. I know there's an enormous amount of changes, but let's go ahead and start with the government. What are they doing and how are they doing it? And then how do you, as, as our listener's advisor, help mitigate that? So what you have to think about is that these are kind of like dials, right? So as we talk about these, the government, the financial institutions, the corporations, they're like levers or dials. And over time, they're going to change the dial and it's either going to, it's going to load up and take more money from us. It's going to erode money from us. But it, it, it's tools that they have put in place to basically to attack the wealth. So when you think about the government, we're subject to you know the U.S. government, the state and local municipalities, et cetera. There are federal taxes, income taxes, right? There are state income taxes. There are local taxes. There are capital gains taxes, social security taxes, sales tax, real estate tax, excise tax, Medicare tax, estate inheritance taxes. And that's before we get into you know foreign aid and devaluation of currencies and things like that. But it's it's when you start thinking about all of these taxes that we're paying, it's not just the federal income tax that we're paying, but it's layers and layers of tax that drive the cost up on everything that we're doing. In most financial strategies, when I look at the the way they're being taxed, not only are they, you know, they're paying more tax than they should today, but the strategy is, is in essence designed to increase taxes over time. That's what we don't want to do because we spend, you know, the focus of everybody is on growing our wealth, getting the highest rate of return that we possibly can on that money with the least amount of risk. I mean, that's really a very worthy concept. Mm hmm. And you see it out there. It's kind of like the rate of return Olympics. Everybody's, you know, oh, that's a great manager. I'm going to go over there. He's a better manager. This stinks. I'm going to buy this, that. And we're constantly, you know, chasing, in essence, yields and chasing returns and chasing things. But meanwhile, in our plan, there's thousands of dollars, if not more, just being sucked away from us that we're not even focused on. And if we spend some time thinking about, the tax situation that I'm in and where I'm paying these taxes, and I really got a good handle on where these taxes were, what strategies can I develop to reduce that tax? So let's say I'm paying $30,000 a year in, in tax and I'm saving you know, $20,000 a year in my strategies just as a mathematical concept. And, I can, and I'm trying to get a 10% return on the, on the 20,000 that I'm saving, right? So that's a nice return. Sure. But if I can drop my taxes, by 10%, save 3000 that's a really nice return on the 20000 Sure, absolutely. <laughs> right? Okay. right, so now, so now, not only am I getting the 10000 you know, the 10% return, but I'm now, at, you know, I've got $3,000 more in my plan to do something with. And over time, that's a tremendous amount of money that's being, you know, if I pay more taxes than I should, then not only have I lost the tax, I've lost the future value or the future potential of that capital. And that's what I'm, you know, I've been focused on with the new tax law. I think most people from what I'm viewing and what I'm looking at, when you run a scenario, old tax law, new tax law, you know, factor in the salt loss and AMT and the different brackets and the mortgage interest deductions and all those factors that are really out there, most people are going to pay less taxes. And they're going to have more money for the next couple of years until it sunsets or it changes, right? Well, that could be ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year in savings. That's an opportunity to put away a tremendous amount of money for the next 
you know, few years that we may not have ever done. So, so the analysis is that as I'm growing my wealth and I'm compounding it, the tax and the inflation are pushing down as pressure. The more tax I pay, not only on the wealth that I'm accumulating, but on my income and my salary and the way I'm being taxed is driving my wealth potential down. It's, the, it's probably the biggest transfer of wealth that I've seen okay. over time. Now, let's talk about financial institutions, because I think some of this is going to be a big eye opener for our listeners. Yeah, and it's you start thinking about the financial institutions that we interact with on a daily basis, banks who are giving us checking accounts and credit cards and lines of credit and mortgages, insurance companies who are giving us insurance, whether it be homeowners insurance or disability insurance or life insurance. These are all of these products have fees and charges and commissions and penalties and have exclusions and they have all these things that are built into them. You know, credit cards, like you walk onto a college campus as a freshman. It used to be really bad, but it's <laughs> it's still out there. Here's a credit card. And it's like, let me get you addicted to the credit card. <laughs> right? Absolutely. And, you know, kids come out with lots of credit card debt on top of student loan debt. Right? So now the financial institution has given you a tool that says, well, I can go out on Friday night and spend money. I can spend money that I don't have currently and I'll pay it off in the future. And they're, and they're kind of shaping the mindset of people. Right. So and it's a worthy pursuit to think about the interest that I'm going to pay on those things or the fees I'm being charged on, you know, the visual fees, the internal fees, there's hidden fees. There's all kinds of things that are on financial products. And the key is you need to understand, OK, what is it that I have? What are the fees that I'm paying? Are those fees good or bad or neutral? Right. You can see they're good, bad or ugly. And. What can I do to minimize the impact of those fees? Now, hold on, John. You just said good, bad. What, what are good fees? Help me with that. Well, you're paying for advice on a portfolio and you're getting good rates of return. And the manager's got a good track record and, you know, it's a worthy fee. It's a good fee. Um, you're paying for income protection on something. Uh, that could be a good fee. Not all fees are bad. I mean, you have to have a fee. Everything has a fee associated with all the index funds. I mean, everything has fees. OK, so what's going on in the strategy? What's happening? Is that a you know, is it a high fee, a medium fee or a low fee? It, it, well, it could be a medium fee. And the historical track record of the portfolio is very good. And it's a top ranked portfolio, despite having a higher fee. You're getting extra value for that. Um, so that could be a good fit. Um, you have a financial planning fee that you pay to an advisor and they reduce your risk. They reduce your taxes. They help you protect more of your wealth and pass more to your family. I would say that's a good fee. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, a little self-serving, but that's a good fee. And that's, you know, you think about it, uh, you think about you're interacting with an insurance company. Let's just talk about that for a second. You buy car insurance. And you buy homeowners insurance and maybe you have a jet ski or, you know, motorcycle or something, some kind of fun tool. And you buy insurance on all of those products. And if the liability limits aren't right or certain things are excluded from that, you're paying premiums that you're not getting the full value. The, the goal for me in my financial in my financial plans is I want to have the least amount of premium being paid with the maximum amount of benefit that the client has. And the insurance company really wants the exact opposite. They want you to pay the highest premium possible and have the lowest benefit out there. And how they do that is having you know low deductibles and low liability limits. And you know they're trying to get the maximum premium out of you with the least amount of exposure. And it looks good on paper. I'm going to save a lot of money. And then when you look at it, you save a lot of money because you don't have as much protection. And now your wealth is at risk. So these are things, you know, you pay your, you pay your car insurance or your life insurance or your disability insurance 
other than annual, right? So they say, okay, the annual premium is going to be a thousand dollars, but if you want to pay that premium monthly, quarterly, or semi-annually, instead of being a thousand dollars, they're going to charge you a factor that you'll pay fifty dollars. You know, you'll pay eighty-seven fifty per month as an example, which when you multiply that by 12, instead of a thousand dollars, it's a thousand fifty. That's five percent interest. Yeah, raw, well, yeah. Right? And some of them are nine or ten. And these are things that are, you know, it's small, but when you say, how much money am I paying in car insurance? How much money am I paying in homeowners insurance? How much money am I paying in disability, long term care, life insurance? You add up those those numbers, it could be quite significant. A couple thousand dollars a year and just you know, they're not even interest charges. They're not deductible, but they are. They're interest charges, but they're, I like to call them hidden. They're not seen, right? And it, with proper cash flow, you could pay annual and save 5%. That, you know, if you add it up and it, let's say you're paying $20,000 a year in premiums between all those things, which a lot of people are, car insurance, homeowners insurance, et cetera, and you could, it's 5%, it's $1,000. Wow. Right? So, a thousand dollars, and we all know the power of compounding, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, thousand dollars a year put away for a whole bunch of years is a lot of money in the future, and it's and, and it's like it's this small little little fissure, little crack in the plan that's just eroding it. Somebody, you know, pays. They go in and they pay. They use a credit card at a local merchant or a big merchant. And you go to the gas station and you buy your gas. You got a cash price. You got a, a credit card price. Well, what's that? It's a finance charge. Right. That's a right. It's a, well, I'm going to pay two seventy five a gallon or two seventy. And well, the credit card's easy. I don't have, I, I don't, I don't have to dig it in my pocket. But when you start thinking about it, that five cents a gallon. You just. I mean, how many gallons? I mean, I put thirty thousand miles a year on a car. That's a lot of gallons of gas, right? And this is what I want people to think about from a strategic standpoint is. How do I minimize the fees? How do I minimize those those charges, those penalties? Like you put money into something, an investment, now, you know, whatever. You think through this, right? And to get out of it, there's significant penalties and charges. Well, if I if if I have all my money in that product and I need to get out of it, the only place I can get money is well, I have a surrender charge, uh, and I have to break it to get money because I had bad advice. Okay. Or it was a bad product, then I'm losing a tremendous amount of money that I should not have been losing because I didn't have the proper liquidity structure in my plan. Right. And it's it's you know there's there's good debt and there's bad debt, and when you start thinking about deductible interest versus non-deductible interest, right? And there's this mindset that says I need to get rid of my debt as quickly as I possibly can. And when you think strategically through what we're talking about, it's if I have a 30 year 4% mortgage versus a 15 year 3.5% mortgage. So it's a half a percent savings. And what they say is, well, Matt, you want a mortgage? You take a 15, we're going to give you a 3.5% rate. If you take a 30, we're going to charge you a premium and you're going to have a 4% rate. And, and now it's like, oh, wow, you know, can I afford the 15? I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay less interest. The bank's happy because now you're giving them money quicker, right? You have less money to invest. You have to make a higher payment. You're getting less deductible interest on your tax return, which means you're paying more money to federal taxes and state taxes. Correct? Absolutely. So, so, so you know, each thing that you do, you have to understand its relationship to other things that are going in your plan because, oh, that makes sense. I'll pay less interest, but... Now I'm paying more money to the to Uncle Sam and I'm giving more money to the bank and I have less money available for, for me to do things during my lifetime. And yes, I get a house paid for faster. I get something like that. But is that really what we want to achieve? And it, I don't know. I'm not saying it's good, bad or ugly. But what I'm saying is that if that's if if I'm going to give more money to Uncle Sam, I'm going to give more money to the bank faster and I'm not using the tool to be strategic as I possibly can. And it's you start thinking about just even 0% financing on cars. It's a wonderful idea, right? Sure. But if I, but if I have to pay 
full price for the car to get the 0% financing versus getting a 15% discount and paying a 5% loan, you might actually have a savings if you got the 15% discount off the car. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well, so, so this, this is like deep, but it's what's happening is, is, is we walk into an institution, we walk into something and we are exposing our wealth. I mean, very simplistic here, ATM fees. Did you go to an ATM this week that was not your, your own bank? Personally, no, John. I always go to my bank because I hate those flipping ATM fees. Yeah, but they're two ninety five, three ninety five. You know, you're at Seven Eleven and you need some cash. Boom, yep. it's two ninety five, right? So you take three dollars out, uh, or you take you know twenty dollars out and have to pay three bucks. That's a pretty hefty uh, penalty there. You take a hundred bucks out, it's three percent. That's huge. You take three hundred bucks, it's one percent. You take twenty bucks. It's ridiculous. And that's what people are doing. It's like for convenience, you know, 15% to get that money out of – to take 20 bucks out. Hmm. So, you know, you, you have to wake up and say, I need to be strategic today. All this money is being dealt with from a standpoint of the – you know, you have to almost have like a, a conspiracy theory. The government's out to get me. The financial institutions are out to get me. The corporations are out to get me. Everybody's out to get my money. I need to be aware of what they're doing to take it from me. So when we start thinking about the corporations, you know, we have inflation, which prices are rising, right? Sometimes prices are rising in different products for different reasons. There's planned obsolescence, which stuff wears out. There's technological change, which is new stuff that came out that I absolutely positively have to have. Then there's style change. It's like I was at an event and a bunch of people were there that – have suits that were really old. They, they didn't look like they were in style. They mm -hmm. didn't care either, which I was happy, but you know, new style comes out, a new body style on a car comes out. Oh, I got to have that. All right. Or I buy a, a terrible product cause I save money, but I got to replace it every 18 months as opposed to buying a little bit higher and I can have it for later. How they package stuff. You know, I love this when you, when you're on the internet, you can, you know, there's three, there's three choices and there was a good book that was written. I forget the guy who wrote the book, but it was basically a study on how they price things. If they offer you two options, it's a hard decision metrics, but if you offer three options, you know, you can get this bundle for nine 99 a month, or you can pay $30 a month for the full amount of products that you're doing. And then there's one in the middle that's $22 a month. And the overwhelming majority of people go to the $22 a month one. And hmm. that makes them extremely – because they packed just in a way that makes sense. Add-ons, right? You, you, you walk into the, the, the store and you're buying a product and now you need this and you need this. and you, Oh, you're going to need this cable and that. You're going to need like 20 other things, right? <laughs> that you, didn't, you just want to go yep. and buy a piece of equipment and now you've got to buy 20 things. And then when you're checking out, they're saying, oh, you should have the insurance on this also. And by the time you've got out, you went in to buy a $100 item, and now you've spent $200 on that same item because you needed all this other add-ons, plus you needed the insurance because if your kid drops it, you're going to have to go back and replace the same item. Now, do most people use that insurance? No, that's why they sell it. It's a huge profit center for them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, shipping and handling, free. Buy this product, it's free. Just pay for shipping and handling. The shipping and handling is tremendously large, right? It's it's twenty nine. It's twenty two dollars to send this thing to me, but it was free. They made the money on the shipping and handling. It's all about perspective, and people people fall for these things, right? There's there's hidden persuasion. So you think about it, it's like. The fashion industry, the car industry, the ski industry, the everybody, the financial institutions are constantly coming out with new things to attract us to buy their products. Because any any business, you and I, we run businesses. We need people to come back and do things. We need to look good all the time. We need to attract people, right? I mean, we're all subject to it. So I don't care if you're the richest person in, 
in the world, you, the government, the financial institutions, the corporations are eroding your capital. And you got to think of these as tools or levers. And we run a cycle and then we change it again. And then we've got people to come back and buy it. I, you know, I buy a dishwasher and, you know, 2008, I redid my kitchen and I have two or three dishwashers since that time frame. Yes, I have four kids. Yes, we we, we have a lot of things going <laughs> through it. But you know, I think we're, it's either two or it's three dishwashers that we've gone through and replacement. And we've had service calls, you know, the service calls. Oh, my God. Just to get the people to come out to fix it because it's too complex, that costs an arm and a leg also. I bought this great product and now I've got to pay for a service call for somebody to come out and fix it after a certain time frame, right? Right. And it seems it seems to just break down just at the end of that timeline. Yeah, they're and then, really good at that. Then they're going to sell me a bunch of parts and, oh, this is not under warranty or that's excluded, right? Well, that's excluded from this and that's excluded from this and that wasn't in the warranty. And these are just things that are just passing. When you think about it, if you sat down and you drew three columns on a piece of paper, you said government – financial institutions and corporations. And you took you took note of the federal taxes, the state taxes, local taxes, capital gain taxes, the social security taxes, all the sales tax that you pay during the course of a year on all the items that, that you buy, your real estate taxes, and Medicare and Medicaid taxes, all right? And you added all that up, that's a lot of money. Then the next time you go through the financial institutions and you say fees, charges, commissions, exclusions, credit card interest, loan interest, the premiums, um, just those areas. How much am I paying there? If I can reduce those costs and get more protection and reduce those finance charges on those call, on those premiums, I'm saving more money. And then I go to the corporations and I understand how planned obsolescence and technological change. You know, nobody had a cell phone in 1990. Well, people did, but normal people didn't have cell phones. Right. Then everybody got a cell phone. And then we realized, well, beyond a phone, now we're going to get data on our phone. And nobody needed data. Now we need data. Now we need as much data as we possibly had because we're watching TV on our phones. We're watching the Olympics on our phones. We're watching, we're just watching everything on our phones. So now the cost of the phone per unit that you have per phone plus the phone itself these prices, these, these are things that you could have never predicted 30 years ago when you were doing your financial plan for your retirement. All right. So been- I'm going to put you on the spot. So, so now we've got these, these, this awareness, right, which was the goal of the podcast was for you to uh, make people aware of these eroding factors. What in God's name do we do about this, John? Well, you make the list. We sit down, we, we understand where the wealth is. Where is, where is your wealth? Matt, where is, what are your taxes? What are all those areas that you're doing? Then apply changes to the plan. What can we do to reduce the tax today and tomorrow? What strategies can we put in place that's going to minimize that? And when I minimize it, what I don't do is let it hit my lifestyle and let the corporations and the financial institutions take it. I actually turn around and I save it and put it in my wealth coordination account. I take it out of my lifestyle. Once I save it, now I'm in control of it. And then I go to the financial institutions and I look at my cable bill and I look at my, you know, most people on a cable bill, you look at the modem that you have. You're paying a monthly rental. That's, when was the last time you got a new modem? And you have this monthly rental that you're paying for, for, tech, for technology that could be three, four, five years old. All right, small little things like let's look at what's happening. What am I do an analysis of all your insurance and figure out what am I paying? Am I paying finance charges? Do I have the least amount of premium that I possibly can have with the max amount of benefit? If whatever I save should be pushed into my savings account. How can I maximize the interest deductions that I'm taking? How can I minimize the impact of the loan interest that I'm that I'm paying? Do I have credit cards? Are we buying things on credit cards? Do I have liquid cash? You know, if I have liquid cash as part, you know, one of the fundamental things that we've talked about structurally in the past was people should have 50% of their annual income in liquid savings. And I don't really care if it's making a return or not. I mean, it's nice if it makes a return, but the liquidity of it 
is what you're focused on. So somebody comes over and you have to acquire something new. Well, there's a cash price and there's a credit card price, right? Yep. If I can negotiate a cash price on something and maybe get 10% off the item that I'm going to buy because I'm going to pay cash for it and I can do it immediately, you know, ready money is Aladdin's lamp, liquid funds. Well, now my money market just made my 0% cash account just made me 10% because I saved 10%. Right. But if I put it on the credit card, I would have paid the full 10% and maybe then I would have got subject to interest charges because I didn't have enough money. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, you, so you go through this and you say, this is everything that I'm doing. What can I do to minimize the impact of that erosion? How do I get the financial institutions to work for me with the least amount of premium, the least amount of expenses, with the maximum amount of protection? And how do I interact with these corporations? Knowing that I'm walking into every time I buy something. And yes, I need to have, I like my phone with data, mm -hmm. right? I love my phone. I want that. But you can negotiate what those costs are. I mean, literally every time I go in, with somebody to get a new phone, the cost of, you know, one of my kids, uh, one of the entourage, right? The, the cost of the, of the data plans, oh, and I complain, I say, ah, this is really high, they reduce it. And it makes me wonder, like, could I have done this sooner? I call up the cable company, I threaten to cancel, it gets cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> you know, these are, these are things like, you know, these are things that, we, you know, satellite radio, the radio in my car was free. Now I have to have satellite radio. It's, you have to look at it too. And you have to think about it. All the things that I'm paying for, am I using them? Am I getting the benefit from them? The gym memberships and the, the streaming video, and the streaming music that I'm paying for and the games that people are paying for, are we getting the value of that? of that the enjoyment from that expense can i reduce that expense and if i can reduce that expense i'm now transferring less money away and when right. i'm buying something if i do good research and i shop it i can save five ten fifteen percent and i that's a habit that i've created and i do that every year there's a lot of money that i'm saving yeah absolutely so, so it's like it's like a mindset thing and even like on on insurance you know you you Many people come in and we look at they have car insurance with X and they have homeowners with Z and the liability limits are wrong and things are wrong. You say, well, let's let's look at let's go back to the agent or let's go back to somebody else and and see if we can raise deductibles and raise the liability limits and then look at bringing the you know, bringing the 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 insurance to one carrier. And then you get discounts and you're paying you're getting more protection for less for less money all of a sudden that happens frequently thousands of dollars being saved and what happens is, is we get stuck in doing what we do you, you i get up every day i go to work and i do my job and then i go home and then i get up and i do it again right mm -hmm. and and i don't think about it and the bill comes in i'm like ah i just pay it because you're busy so you have to have this mindset that i i understand that the new shiny object is really <laughs> do i really necessarily need the shiny object do i need to and if i yes i need it because i want it i simply want it and that's important like i want it fine yes great it, 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 how can i get the best deal on it the best deal is gonna take a little bit of time but if you're gonna have a, a vehicle for 36 months or you know whatever a house a boat a rental property whatever you're purchasing the better you can do on it the better you, the more money you earn over the long run Right. And it's it, it's just a mindset. And I, I don't I know people know it's happening. And it, like this is not like an earth shattering podcast like, oh, wealth is being transferred from us. But, but I don't think people really know it because I don't think people really spend enough time focused on what is being transferred away from themselves. Our focus. We've been taught to focus on the shiny object. We've been taught, mm -hmm. taught to focus on the rate of return. We've been focused on the rate of return Olympics. And there's that, that they, they, they're focusing us in the wrong direction. And I think we've got to come back and say rate of return is important. The shiny object is important. But let's work on our strategy. And the strategy should reduce the taxes. It should reduce the risk. When I reduce the risk – you know, let's talk about market risk. I'm reducing the volatility of, of a portfolio. There's less – there's less volatility. There's less erosion of capital, right? 
that's a worthy example. And I think I, I don't think we've done this on a past piece, but if you talk about market fluctuation, right, and you basically have a sequence of returns, we've heard we've talked about this, right? Did we talk about this? No. We yeah, uh, we have absolutely talked about sequence of returns. Yeah. All right. So we have a so we have a sequence where there's a hundred percent return the first year and a minus fifty percent the second year. If I took the average of that, hundred minus fifty is fifty divided by two is twenty five. So I, in my spreadsheet, most people there is an average rate of return of twenty. Five percent. So first year the money goes to one hundred twenty-five thousand, hundred up by twenty-five percent. Next year it would go to one hundred fifty-six thousand. That's the expectation. But money with market fluctuations is a commodity and is subject to erosion principles. So so the market fluctuation basically says, well, the hundred would have gone to actually two hundred thousand, and now the market's you know that sequence of return is now down fifty percent. The wealth is back down to $100,000. The actual return is zero. It's not math. It's money. Right. And it's – right? So so it's a worthy – you know, over long extended periods of time where you have big ups and big downs, that high volatility creates a, a reduction in the amount of wealth. And, and you want to kind of – you want to flatten that – the highs and the lows out and you want to – and you want to understand how do I do that? And, you know, these are things that that as I go through the plan, I reduce the tax, I reduce the risk, the market risk. But also when you think about risk, risk is not just market risk. It's lawsuit risk, property and casualty loss risk, being underinsured, disability risk, long term care risk. That's, you know, you think about a financial institution or a corporation, the corporate, the long term care facility is systematically robbing millions and millions of dollars from people every single year, right? You could say it's bad it's bad planning, but there's no alternative, right? It costs a tremendous amount of money. And the idea is that the risk is is that all of that are risks that are basically things that need to be factored into to the plan. The fees and the costs, the interest charges, all of that needs to be focused on so that if you reduce taxes and you reduce the volatility and you reduce the risk and you decrease the expenses and the fees and the cost, you now have more money to save. And it could be significant depending upon the amount of money that you earn. Absolutely. And it, it and that's as worthy of a pursuit as the shiny object rate of return. Right. And to me, it, it, it's, it's about strategy. So you get your strategy right so that the strategy – is right now you pick your you pick those good products, but your strategy is right. You don't start with products; you start with strategy. So, if your financial services professional is not talking to you about these things, this strategy focusing on the things that are eroding your wealth, you should probably reconsider and work with somebody who keeps those things in mind. All right, John. Closing statements, ideas. It's, this is something that it's it's like going to the gym which is another eroding factor if you're not using it, right? But going to the gym, if you go every day, you're going to get results and you do something. This is the same thing. You have to take an approach that 365 days a year, I'm aware of the wealth that's being transferred from me and I'm thinking about how do I retain and recapture and keep the money, as much money as I possibly can. And I, we welcome the opportunity to talk to anybody about this and this is something that as I'm redoing and relooking at all of my clients' financial strategies, not only are we looking at it from the 2017 tax law change, comparing last year's taxes to 2018 and saying, what can we do today to start reducing those taxes and making it even better under the new tax law and being prepared for the sunset if it ever does. But those are things that you should be looking at Relooking at those at those components of your plan on a regular basis to make sure that I didn't get trapped back into it. 
again. And it, it happens. It happens to everybody. And you know, I have it happening all over my plan. And I keep focusing and reducing and keep focusing and reducing. And it creeps back in. So sure. it's, it's, it has to happen on an ongoing basis is what I'm saying. Gotcha. And if you're not sitting down with an advisor and looking at that on a regular basis, at least an annual basis, then I seriously would like for you to reach out and talk to John. And with that, John, thank you very much for your thought leadership today. Matt, thank you. And this was the three core financial pressures eroding your wealth with John Smallwood. I'm Matt Halloran. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, make sure you take a moment to subscribe to the podcast. That way, every time John comes up with a podcast like this and an idea that can help you reduce the eroding factors, you can share it not only with yourself, but with your friends and families. So with that, we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Welcome to the end of the video. Smallwood Wealth Management is an investment advisor representative. The opinions expressed by Smallwood Wealth Management and guests on this show are their own. All statements and opinions expressed are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice, information presented for this educational purposes only. Moreover, no listener should assume that any discussions or information presented serves as a receipt of or substitute for personalized advice from Smallwood Wealth Management or from any other investment professional and is not intended as an offer of solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Smallwood Wealth Management is not a law firm or an accounting firm and no portion of this presentation should be interpreted as legal, accounting, or tax advice. Information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as a recommendation appropriate for any individual. Listeners are encouraged to seek advice from a qualified tax, legal, or investment advisor to determine whether any information presented may be suitable for their specific situation. Thank you for listening.